Good evening and welcome to the Asian American and Pacific Islanders Community Conversation with Maryland's State Superintendent of Public Schools, Mahama Chaudhry. Uh, I am Young Chan Han, Senior Family Engagement Specialist at MAEC, Mid-Atlantic Equity Consortium, and I'll be your facilitator this evening. It is my pleasure to welcome Superintendent Mohama Chaudhry, our community conversation participants, interpreters, and our viewers. To listen to tonight's conversation in Mandarin, please call 339-207-8038. The Asian American and Pacific Islander AAPI community is incredibly diverse in Maryland. According to the most recent American Community Survey, the top five birthplaces for Asian Americans in Maryland are the U.S., many are U.S. born, India, China, the Philippines, and Korea. Most of us share the desire to have our culture, language, and values recognized and celebrated and many of us are multilingual and can share these languages, language skills with our schools and communities. Um, unfortunately, since the COVID-19 pandemic, AAPI communities have experienced heightened discrimination and hate incidents. So tonight we will hear from AAPI students and families about their experiences in their local school communities and their ideas for the future of education in Maryland. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few expectations and housekeeping items. We are live streaming this conversation on YouTube from 6 to 7.30 p.m. If you are viewing the live stream, you can use the chat to make comments throughout the evening. As a reminder to our participants, this meeting is live streamed and recorded so your participation implies consent to be recorded. When you're not speaking, please stay muted and use the chat function if we are running short on time and there are additional comments you would like to add. Um, now we will hear from Superintendent Chaudhry for his opening remarks. Thank you, thank you very much. I wanna thank you guys for coming here today. Uh, this is a topic um, that I've been wanting to do um, for a while now. Um, I mean, I say for a while, I've been here eight months, but for me, um, you know, it's it's as an Asian American myself, um, as someone who uh, constantly has to find myself re-explaining, right, uh, my culture, my identity, um, you know, it's Ramadan right now. I always love Ramadan because everyone is always learning something about being a Muslim American um, or, 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 or even what, where, where my family's from. I'm a Bengali American born and raised in Los Angeles. We are an incredibly diverse group. Um, and too often, right, um, more often than not, it's washed in, in one color and that's a problem. And, and I think there's no better time than now to make sure that we spend the time to really not only um, make sure that our education system is designed to not reinforce uh, these issues and challenges, but find ways to break through from it. Um, we often talk about proficiency in reading and math, but we don't talk enough about cultural proficiency. And that's something I often like to talk about. So today you are invited here um, uh, to speak your truth, right? Um, and as we explore our topics, um, you know, it's uh, really great to see. I, I spent, uh, you know, um, a good amount of time um, in multiple states. And so Maryland, um, you know, is known for being um, one of the nickname is America in miniature and truly it is, including the changing face of our country. Um, and so it's a very beautiful thing. And I really, really appreciate your time today. Uh, this is really about our department. We're in the middle of strategic planning. Uh, we plan to put it out in October, by October of 22, but one of those on the road to planning for our uh, ultimate strategic plan, we wanted to do a series of roundtables uh, with all of our communities in Maryland. Um, so that's why you're here today, um, if you were wondering. And it's also important to me to expand the tent in how the department engages. And so I really appreciate you guys uh, taking up the offer to have a conversation with me today. Um, so with that, I'm looking forward to hearing your thoughts. And again, please speak your truth, as I like to often say, because uh, we all must be 
become more and more culturally proficient every day um, in order just to be our best self. So I really thank you for this time and honor to hear your stories. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your opening remarks, Superintendent Chaudhary. Now we would like to meet our participants. So please introduce yourself by stating your full name, your role as a student or a family member, and your school system. So we will start and let's start with Jay. So hi everyone, my name is Jay Guan. Uh, I'm a parent of a first grader in Montgomery County. My kid goes to um, Wilson Williams Elementary School in uh, Montgomery County Public Schools. YJ. So nice to meet you everybody. My name is YJ Wu. Um, I'm the mother of the first grader in the Howard County uh, public school system. Nice to meet you. Thank you. Su Feng. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm um, uh, have two boys in the pri uh, proper school in Waikamoko County. They are first grade and uh, uh, they are third grade and fifth grade. Thank you. Uh, Emily. Do we have Emily? No, not yet. Let's move to Anisha. Oh. Nope, sorry. Oh, there you go, Emily. Go ahead. <laughs> Hi everyone, my name is Emily Liu and I am a 10th grade student in the Montgomery County Public School System. Thank you. Uh, how about Anusha? Hi everyone, I'm Anusha Khan. I am a 10th grader in the Frederick County Public School System. Okay, uh, Hiba. Hi everyone, I'm Hiba Khan. I am a senior in the Charles County Public School System. Great. Uh, Zotam. Hi everyone. Uh, I am Zo Tumhong. My son David Mung goes to Northfield Elementary School in Howard County Public Schools. Thank you. Thank you, Sunil. Good evening. Uh, I have one. Um, I'm from Montgomery County, and my kids go to Montgomery County Public Schools. Uh, I have one kid at each level, elementary, middle, and high school, but thankfully that'll end th after this year. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Amy. Hi, good evening, everyone. My name is Amy Fry. I'm a parent to a second grader and fourth grader in the Prince George's County Public School System. Um, and I'm just grateful to share this space with all of you this evening. Thank you, Amy. Uh, Amir Amaris. Hi, I'm Amaris Lee, and I am a 10th grader in the Montgomery County Public Schools. You and Connie. Good evening, everyone. My name is Connie Choi. I went, I attended school in Montgomery County. Um, I have a 13 year old that attends Walker Mill Middle School that's in the honors program at Prince George's County um, Public Schools. Thank you. Great, thank you. Stacy. Hello, my name is Stacy Hall and I live in Howard County. My children are in third grade and first grade in Howard County Public Schools. Great, uh, Crystal. I thought I saw Crystal. Ne my son is I did say, oh, unmute, unmute. Okay, my name is Chris Lee. Uh, I'm the mother of uh, the Montgomery County students. Thank you. Ming? Hello, my name is Ming Li. I'm the father of two students from the River Hill High School of the Harrow County Public, uh, Public School System. Uh, thank you for inviting me to this event. Thank you. How about Ryan? Hello, my name is Ryan Zhao. I'm a ninth grader at Howard High School in Howard County Public School System. Great. Uh, Sahitya, did I do that right? Hello, my name is Sahitya Sadakar, and I am a sophomore in Kale County Public Schools and will be serving my term as the student rep on the Kale County Board of Ed. 
in the 2023-2024 school year. Great, thank you. Um, did I miss anybody? I think we all, I think everybody has opportunity to say hello. Great. So thank you for introducing yourselves. Um, as we transition into our questions, we are looking forward to a rich and robust conversation about your experiences. We have a lot to discuss and a limited amount of time for all of our participants to share. So each participant chose questions that are most important to them to discuss this evening. So we will be calling on you for those specific questions to make sure everyone is able to share. To our YouTube live viewers, please share your thoughts on the questions in the chat. So let's start, are, you, are we ready? Let's start with a question number one. Uh, we know how important it is for students and families to have a sense of belonging and share our culture, language, and values with our communities. Do you currently feel that sense of belonging and celebration of your culture in your school communities? What did educators and school leaders do to create more inclusive spaces for AAPI students and families? And what did they need to do better? Amy, do you want to start off with that question? Sure, thank you. Um, so I would say for our current school right now, I've been very appreciative of the leadership from our principal, um, who's very, who's been very responsive um, for ideas to, to celebrate and share uh, one's culture. Uh, so this year, when we were celebrating Lunar New Year, it also simulta simultaneously landed on the first day of Black History Month, which is, you know, also a very big. Um, Kind of learning period for our, our youth as well. And so when I had mentioned that she sent me over a slide saying that, you know, in their morning announcements, they were going to you know celebrate and she um, on the slide, it actually it, it said Chinese New Year, happy Chinese New Year. And I wrote her back and I said, well, could we please um, make it Lunar New Year? Because it's more than one culture that celebrates Lunar New Year and not all Asian cultures celebrate Lunar New Year. And her response was just very open. Thank you for the correction. And, um, from that, we've had more conversation. What are we going to do for Asian American Pacific Islander Heritage Month? And so we've already had a meeting with some of the other um, AAPI families, staff, um, as well as faculty about, you know, what we might do. And there's a plan for a day where we're going to be celebrating different things from um, food, games that are played on different traditional holidays, um, traditional clothing, um, and almost like a fashion show. Um, my daughter has been, um, what's the word? Volunteer told that she's going to be doing a K-pop history and one of her friends wants to do it with her and they're going to, you know, have a little presentation. And at the end of the day, uh, we're going to learn about Holi and then do some Holi celebration, um, sending the kids home just colorful and beautiful. So I think for me in our particular school now, um, she's been very, um, the leadership has been very open to these conversations. What can we do to spread awareness? Um, we had just recently transferred from another school and those conversations um, were kind of met with, oh yeah, that's nice, but I think the focus was more on testing curriculum. We don't really have time to incorporate these, I guess what we consider fun activities, but for me, they're not just fun activities. They are also um, educational opportunities for our kids to learn that learning is fun. So I think it really comes down to the openness of the leadership at the school to be willing to have those conversations and, and see how do we incorporate um, and, and using the, the, the resources you have, whether it's faculty, families, and uh, getting everybody invested into, into the events that are happening at school. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing, um, Amy. Um, I'm looking forward to the K-pop history. I wish I would know more about that. <laughs> so how about Amaris? Do you want to go next for the same question? Um, for me, um, I feel like I feel pretty included in the school since like um, even there's holidays for people to celebrate, they allow you to like um, talk about it and they also present slideshows like at school. But like um, for some people that like don't know the language that well, um, I feel like some people like they could create meetings or um, clubs to like help people that have difficulties in language um, to like um, help them to learn the language and like be a bigger part of the community and communicate with people that probably don't speak the same language they do. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let's move to uh, Jay. Do we have, there you go. 
Yep. Uh, in terms of sense, sense of belonging, I think my my kids' school and the community is relatively speaking uh, very accepting and very uh, very inclusive of of various cultures. Uh, my my school community is actually a uh, majority immigrant. Um, um, uh, they are either of uh, um, East Asian or South Asian descent, and the school community has been has been very really, very really inclusive and accepting. So we have International Night. Our community has. Um, has Lunar New Year celebrations and also um, Diwali celebrations. Um, this, uh, but um, for the district as a whole, I think there are three things that we are work that, that are work in progress and can do better. One is uh, the staff uh, cultural proficiency mm -hmm. um, as part of the the, uh, the district's uh, Asian Pacific American Student Achievement Action Group. We advocated for cultural proficiency trainings for staff. And that has been uh, implemented for two years, but in terms of participation, I think we can do a little bit better on that. The second part, I think, um, when it comes to sense of belonging, I think it, it comes to um, history or the teaching of Asian American history. So our student needs to be um, needs to see their history reflected in the social social study curriculum to have that sense of belonging. I think. Through my own experience uh, throughout through the school system, public school system and my currently my kids um, own experience, I think this is a very important aspect. In creating that sense of belonging. Um, I think 1 last thing uh, would be. Oh, it's skipping on me at the moment, but um, there was 1 last. So you said cultural proficiency, uh, you said culturally relevant curriculum, yep. and then the third one was. <laughs> I'm ready to write it down too. It's fine. If that doesn't come to you, I have a follow up. Uh, the cultural proficiency training, mm -hmm. um, what, what does that entail? What does that look like or uh, for what you guys pushed for? I'm, I'm just curious about that as I, because, you know, my job is to constantly think scale and the state, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm curious what that looks like. So we are working, we actually, we work with the uh, University of Maryland College Park's Asian American Study Department to come up with the curriculum and the content for the cultural profi proficiency uh, training. A lot of it has to ha, has to do with educating our staff and educators about Asian American history, about the various stereotypes and their origins, and how these um, stereotypes, such as the the model minority myth, how that would impact interactions between um, Asian American uh, students and, and staff members. So, one mm -hmm. concrete example would be a counselor would think that perhaps they would think that a, an Asian American student would be really good at math, and so they keep on pushing that. To take on more advanced courses in in math, but in real in, in realistically, that student may need help in math. Mm -hmm. So that's the one, one one example. Got it. That's great. Did you remember the third thing? No. <laughs> I'll come back to it. It comes back. I was I was trying to I was trying to buy you time, but. <laughs> Right. Let, let me know when it comes back, okay? <laughs> so let's thank you. Let's move to um, YJ. Same question. Yeah. Um, so I, I just, uh, okay. Uh, I prepared this script so that I don't um, run out of the time for this meeting. Oh, um, so, okay. yeah. So diversity can be the positive factors only when the, the effort toward the intercultural understanding takes place in our daily life. But I wonder whether the school system has put an importance to it and has put an effort into promoting the learning of the different cultures, which would lead to the inclusiveness, sense of belonging of the minority groups of students, acceptance and respect. Their realities know. Um, it's interest. I mean, it is it uh, exciting to hear that um, many panels here experience those inclusiveness, which actually surprised me. So a uh, shout out to you guys. <laughs> um, by the way. Uh, we understand that the factors such as the legal liability, the lengthy political and administrative process, mainly focusing on the academic progress and achievement, etc., would adversely affect in implementing new system of making the differences into the familiarity in the educational field. But is, isn't it the main purpose of education, which have to help us obtain the knowledge and experiences we have not been familiar with? Mr. Sammy's statement, the youngest, the youngest Holocaust survivor was invited to be a speaker at the Howard County Library on April 12th. He repeatedly emphasized that only the education can eradicate, eradicate any and all kinds of the hate. 
and the influ influential figures like the politicians have to use the right words to teach the younger generation because young ones don't research on their own and mainly not the ones here and uh, but they uh, tend to get the wrong idea my friend's kindergartner experienced racism from the teacher and eventually transferred to a private school Another friend of mine has a middle school daughter whose severe disability level requires a close uh, restroom help from the female aid, which the school refused to accommodate, stating that my friend is the one who reverse discriminate the male aid. The racism and lack of culture and compassion is the current address of the education that leaves us much room to improve. If I had lump sum of money, to improve racism, I would like to establish the International Cultural Center and the Middle High School International Student Committee. They can work together with the local library system and the university that has the international relations department like Mr. J talked about. It's very impressive that we are already doing so, which is not, which we don't have in our Howard County, unfortunately yet, but hopefully we soon can do it. Um, by the way, those uh, like students who would be involved in the in student committee can would periodically do the research and make the YouTube educational videos on the different cultures and go around the schools to peer introduce and educate the cultures. And pop song translation class, something like similar to what uh, Miss Amy mentioned earlier, like the history of the K-pop stars and so, so on. And photo exhibition show, cooking show, etc., can be some idea of their activities. There are more things to talk, but I'd like to respect the duration of this meeting. And lastly, I only wish this meeting would not end up being part of the bureau bureaucratism or promoting the popularity in the election. Thank you very much. I can assure you it will not be the last things that you mentioned. Um, and um and then if i don't everyone should know who bts is and plus anyone else in k-pop so i mean they are <laughs> the most popular boy band in the world so yeah so um i, I sorry uh young chan i had to show off my k-pop knowledge <laughs> no thank you thank you i'm so happy to hear that because i'm all i'm also you know yeah. i love bts right we all do um <laughs> let's move on thank you ij um let's uh how about hiba can you respond to this same question, please? Sure, thank you. Um, so currently I am one of two Pakistani students in my entire school of around 900 students. However, I will say that my school has an extremely large ESOL population, so English as a second language students, and there's a lot of promotion for diversity in my school and inclusivity. So for instance, last month we had a large county expo where all of our ESOL student body was able to present to members of the community about their culture. And it was a really great event. Lots of people came and it was a really great way to promote our culture to the community and get people involved. But I think that even with these resources, I, I don't think it's as inclusive as I would like it to be. And in my experience, I would also concur with what some of the previous sentiments of the other people who were talking, I think that the public school system doesn't emphasize teaching Asian American history in schools and many students aren't educated enough about it. I think that there isn't really a culturally relevant curriculum for Asian Americans. And um, for instance, this is also somewhat related. There's a large population of South Asian and West Asian students in my county who are also Muslim and Muslim students don't actually get a day off for the religious holiday Eid in my district and students have to kind of choose between, you know, education and religion. And our community also doesn't have any type of celebration for a Lunar New Year or um, Diwali celebration. So I think there's a lot of work to be done in those areas as well. And also in terms of Asian American Pacific Islander Month, the leadership in my school in particular doesn't put much active effort into recognizing and incorporating cultural inclusivity as much as I would like, um, especially after COVID, you know, um, schools have kind of shifted their priorities a lot, which is completely understandable. You know, it had such a big impact on so many students and there are a lot of things that have changed in the school climate as a result of the pandemic, but it has also um, reduced a lot of the, um, a lot of the 
promotion of different cultures and diversity in schools. And I'd also like to include that I often feel like Asians are an overlooked minority in my school in particular, because the entire group is often mislabeled as a model minority. And I think because of that, Asians lack a lot of support and mentors in school systems, especially when it comes to college and career preparation because of these false stereotypes. And um, in addition, I'd like to add that the Asian bucket is such a broad bucket and the Asian American and Pacific Islander communities encompass so many different cultures, like even in this WebEx, you know, there's so many different people of different backgrounds and different histories and experiences, and it's growing to include even more. And I think people need to recognize that and be educated about that um, in high school and middle school, you know, in all levels of education. Um, just my personal experience, like most of my life, when I tell people I'm from Pakistan, they'd be like, you know, where is that? And I have to tell them, oh, it's right next to India. And um, you know, it's just a universal experience for a lot of Pakistanis, and I think we need to do a better job at educating people about Asian American history and culture in my district in particular. So thank you for allowing me to answer that question. What grade are you in, Hiba? <laughs> I'm a senior in high school. Oh, God, so you're moving on. You can't become... Part of, I'm, I'm going to be putting together a task force that's going to uh, look at AP, a, a API history in Maryland's curriculum uh, and to make a set of recommendations. I was going to invite you to do it, but you got to go off to college or wherever you're going next. Um, and I know the feeling of describing where your country is. So I say my country is next to Pakistan because my family's from Bangladesh. <laughs> and so uh, are you good about keeping all the fast since you brought up Eid as well? Yes, I have been keeping all of them so far. I will not answer. Don't ask me that question. So, uh, so, but I appreciate uh, uh, hearing that, and it's good to hear about that holiday piece because you know there are some school systems that have made that decision to recognize those holidays. So, thank you for sharing. You're welcome. Thank you for allowing me to answer. Thank you, Hiba. I'm so happy that you are in that school, though. I think you're the one who's going to make a difference and make sure that others know about Pakistani culture too. So, thank you. Um, let's move on. Oh, we'll do the same question. Uh, we have little time. Anusha? Hi, everyone. So I definitely agree a lot with Hiba about a lot of sentiments regarding being a Pakistani American student. I cer certainly speak from a place of privilege when I say that I serve on the racial equity committee for Frederick County Public Schools. So I see a lot of the behind the scenes of what our board of education is doing in order to help AAPI students. However, our committee is very limited on resources and things that we can actually do because of how many other committees that actually plan other things. So as much as we can make anti-racist policies and things like that, we don't really get a say in curriculums and things like that other than like, you know, a quick like check in the corner that we looked over it and then passing it on to the board to approve. So I think I agree with, you know, Jay and I agree with everybody else who has said that I think it's important that we have an Asian American studies class. Uh, we recently pa passed a African American and black um, community studies class and I think that's really great that we can move towards having a lot more students. Um, also, I believe we are now seeing our first wave of um, Afghani refugees at my school in our ESL classes and everything like that. So I think it's imperative that we learn more about South or not just South Asian culture, but Asian culture in general. Uh, recently, we did have our international night, but that was put on by a club at our school. Um, so I think in general, it's just, you know, once we open that door to like, uh, you know, validating the identity of Asian Americans, I definitely haven't seen as many teachers um, who are Asian American like myself. So, um, uh, when we open the doors to like learning about Asian American history, I think it'll be really great to see more teachers be open about their identity because uh, this past semester I had a teacher. She was also South Asian American. And so I could tell by her name that she was. However, I was scared to like ask her questions, ask her about her identity because it was just something that um, a lot of my teachers, her and in the past, have just felt the need to like be quiet about their identity just because um, especially if you're from like South Asia or the Middle East, it's definitely a little more stigmatized to talk about your background. Um, and so in general, I feel like it's just important that we open up that conversation to validate Asian American teachers. Even I have to give a lot of credit to Frederick County Public Schools, though. Um, we have moved a lot away, like into being more racially, um, like 
we, being more culturally proficient, um, being right next to Montgomery County, we do have a lot of um, immigrants and first generation families that come into our county, but you definitely see towards more the border like Poolsville and Imesville, um, where you see a lot of immigrant families or you see a lot of students of color. And so where I am specifically in Frederick City, uh, we don't see that as much as we see Asian Americans. We don't see Asian Americans as much as we see, you know, our Hispanic population from our black population. So, um, you know, I feel like in general, just for the well-being of the whole county, that we'd be more proficient in Asian American uh, culture. Um, other than that, I feel like that's really all I had to cover because uh, there is one school more towards Montgomery County that is um, more like South Asian and East Asian heavily populated. And I feel like they don't get the kind of attention and recognition that they deserve within their school because there is no concrete boundaries for what the school has to provide, at least so that we don't face stereotypes. I mean, a lot of times before I started wearing hijab, which is something that a lot of Muslim women wear, a lot of people thought I was Indian and they thought I was Hindu, and there were a lot of stereotypes that were perpetuated against me. Now that I wear hijab, a lot of people tend to think that I'm Arab, or people tend to think I'm not a very stand-up type of person. They tend to think I'm a very quiet person or I'm non-confrontational. Um, so I feel like if we talk more about not only just Asian American students, but you know, that uh, relationship to uh, religion and things like that, like how we have East Asian religions and we also have Islam as um, an impact on our cultures. I feel like that's really important to, as something we would want to add into the Asian American studies if we were to move forward and Frederick County would do something like that in the future. You have hit on so many important topics. And, you know, the other sad thing is the stereotypes are also used against one another, right, um, by the other culture. I always think back about the first death that happened after 9-11 at the gas station, right? Um, and that was not even a person who was Muslim, but that didn't matter to that person, just ignorance and hate. And so I appreciate you bringing that up to the conversation. So thank you. Uh, uh, for being really deep. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Anisha. Um, how about Ming? I think we have time for one more. Let's see. Thank Ming? you, Yang Chong. Yes. Um, so uh, in terms of uh, diversity and inclusion, and uh, definitely, I believe, uh, the uh, Howard County Public School System at River Hill uh, High School uh, on the right direction. But uh, most of them still remain on the paperwork or just a discussion. So still, there are a lot of work to do. Um, I, I echo uh, what we already heard, a lot of good developments. For example, the uh, inclusion of the Lunar New Year and the celebration. But uh, after my wife uh, decorated the school with some beautiful lantern or beautiful banners, and a couple of days later, I checked with my daughter, who is a senior in a high uh, uh, River Hill High School, and I said, uh, did you notice, and uh, did your friend talk about that? Well, I would answer that, yeah, nobody care, nobody pay any attention to that. So it's kind of a still ignorance to this uh, multicultural, the diversity type of thing. And uh, also, I believe that stems from, so there, I call that our uh, student, their identity crisis. A lot of uh, students, including my daughters, so at some time they don't want to be recognized. Uh, they're different from, you know, the rest of the the the, the students. Especially, they, they don't want to be recognized different from the white students. And uh, well, um, sometimes during the discussion when we discuss diversity inclusion, sometimes equity, and a lot of the time, Asian are categorized as white. I really don't understand why this happened, why we are considered as white. And uh, so this is something that we need to work on. I definitely echo Jay and Heba and who else and talked about uh, uh, the education. So I believe that this ignorance stem from the uh, inadequacy of our curriculum, not necessarily from we need to teach from the day one, for example, Indian culture, China, Chinese culture, or you know, Arab culture. Not on that, but we need to focus on the API curriculum, on the API history in the United States. So a lot of confusion when I talk to the um, HCPSS, the Harvard County Public School System staff, they misunderstood, thought we need, we're asking to include the whole history of the, all the Asian countries, they told me 
it's impossible. I said, no, 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 no. We just want you to include, to recognize Asian American, API, we are Americans. And mm -hmm. we have our own identity, own culture, own heritage. Please recognize that and start educating our students, no matter their color, no matter of their ethnic groups, start regularly recognizing we are all Americans. And uh, then later, my daughter or whoever, the daughter from this group, they can be proudly claim I'm from, I have the Indian heritage, I have the, the Chinese heritage, the Korean heritage, and whatever heritage. Instead of their shame, then they try to hide their identity. So a lot of uh, trouble and the problems stem from those uh, identity crises, for example, they're always confused at school and at, uh, you know, in, uh, at, at their own house, they're always confused. And uh, many times contribute, for example, more severe problems like mental health issues. So I blame all, the, all, all that. And uh, in addition to the curriculum, I believe I cannot speak for other uh, school systems, but for the Harrow County school systems, they try hard, but still the representation of the API staffing is not adequate. We are underrepresented. So if possible, I would really to say there are more teachers, staff, or even the high level man managers, uh, administrative you know, managers, they're in different colors. All right, I'll just stop here. I know we have limited time. Thank you so much. Thank you for sharing that. Um, yes, it is a big, I would say it's an excuse to say the embedding uh, um, a AAPI curriculum is not saying teach about every single country. That's not what that is asking. It's about teaching cultural proficiency skills by studying deeply specific moments throughout history that highlights various cultural experiences. You know, I, I'd say one of the most powerful moments I had during my K-12 experience was in an English class where the teacher chose farewell to Manzanar. You know, I would have never learned about the history of America interning Japanese Americans, um, you know, a shameful act in our country uh, that we don't study uh, deeply enough, but just that experience alone, you know, developed so many skills for me to just even understand, right? Distinguishing between Japanese history and other aspects of it as a child, right? So it's the it's it, I didn't have to learn about every other country necessarily right. around Japan, but just that experience alone and made me think about World War II differently. So it's Absolutely. it's about that. So um, well, know that the state superintendent is thinking about this. So I really appreciate you. you totally sharing. agree. Totally agree. Thank you so much. And also, I'm very excited to learn that uh, you have a plan to establish that task force. Yeah. And uh, we, if we have opportunity to join that, and absolutely, our thought, I will we be. Really will, appreciate yeah, that. It's going to be a year long process and we I want to basically use that to make a set of recommendations to make some changes so great thank you so much thank you thank you both thank you um, superintendent Chaudhry for sharing your vision so we're really excited to hear that uh, we have one more person one more parent who wanted to uh, respond to this question and I'm going to open the mic to Stacy all yours hi everyone so in short, I do not currently feel that my culture is really celebrated in my children's school environment. Um, I honestly, I feel that we're very invisible and I know it's not for a lack of effort. Um, many of you had mentioned International Night as one of the events that your schools do. And that's actually something I wanted to talk about because before the pandemic, my children's school hosted an event called International Night where the families could introduce their country of origin, cultural characteristics, its foods, et cetera. This was a very interesting celebration of different countries and cultures, but honestly, it did not make me feel more included or honored as an Asian American. It actually made me feel even more othered, if anything else, because by lumping people like me into the international community, um, I did not relate to that because I'm a second generation of my immigrant parents and my children are third generation Asian Americans, and I don't consider myself to be international. So I would like for my Asian American cultural identity to be celebrated and valued. Um, the unique Asian um, immigrant experience and the history of Asian Americans who have found a place for themselves in this country is something that I really wish would be taught to my children in school. So I also echo the sentiment that I really would like for our Asian American immigrant history to be included in American history. 
Um, and another note about that is that I would love for my children to know about Korean culture and have some degree of cultural proficiency in their own heritage culture and some ethnic pride too, but I would never want them to have to bear the burden of representing Korean culture to their non-Asian peers or take on the responsibility of educating their peers because I feel like this is a form of emotional labor that should not be put upon the shoulders of young Asian American kids and their families, but rather it really should just be the responsibility of the school system, social studies curriculum. So I do feel that the curriculum needs an update, but also that educators at all levels really should receive more diversity training so they can be more sensitive to various cultural identities that children of color may hold. Um, one mm -hmm. example is my child, when he was in kindergarten, he was asked by his teacher, where are you from? The dreaded question. <laughs> and he answered, this is a kindergartner, he answered, well, I'm Asian and my ancestors are from Korea, but I'm not from Korea, so I think I'm Korean Asian American. And I was so proud of this because I, I heard him talk at home. This was during the home online virtual learning. His answer was very nuanced and also very accurate. But then I heard his teacher correct him and say, oh, sweetie, that means you are from Korea. And that <laughs> night, his teacher and the principal received a very long email from me explaining <laughs> why my child should never again be told that he is from Korea because we are he is not from Korea. We're not a monolith. So um, revamping the social studies curriculum to include more Asian American history and changing people of mindset, all necessary things, but I know it takes time. So in the meantime, I think it's helpful that school administrators would recognize Asian Pacific Islander Heritage Month, use that time to learn more about Asian American people and American history. But I do think that it starts with education because events can only take us so far. I really do think it's more knowledge that will change things. So thank you, Stacey. You're right. I mean, we can't limit these to like so and so night and so and so night. And sometimes it sounds like that's where you're just even fighting for that. And that's just that. And then and then and when you look at those nights, they get limited to very, you know, um, superficial things like food and or or just dress versus actually talking about history and culture. And uh, nothing drives you more crazy when you know people ask me that question, "Where are you from?" And I say. Los Angeles, California, uh, and and they're like, no, 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 where are you from? Uh, 800 North Block Orange Drive, Los Angeles, <laughs> California. I was like, you know, it's the it's that hyphenated existence. So like Bengali American, you know, um, it's 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 something you have to navigate, right? Even when you are born here as well, too, still, and that's not okay. So I really appreciate you bringing up those uh, complex ideas uh, to the forefront. Thank you. Thank you. Um, where are you from? Always, I think there's a floodgate of emotions <laughs> open up when we hear that question. So thank you, everyone. Um, we're going to move on to the next question. So we had many of you selected question one, and we have a little less folks. So for the time, we will ask, and there might be a couple of people that who wanted to respond may not. So um, just don't hold me to it. So we'll try. We'll see. So please honor two or uh, less minutes if, if at all possible. So second question, speaking more than one language is an asset and most AAPI students and families are multilingual. What, uh, what would you like to see your schools do to enhance, nurture, or grow the existing language skills of our multilingual students. Um, Zoe, do you want to start? Uh, thank you. Thank you, Young Chow, for this opportunity. And um, thank you to the state superintendent. Um, I am Zoe Tung Mong. Um, I was born in Chin State, Burma. Uh, Burma borders to, I used to say, India and China and then Bangladesh yeah. <laughs> uh, because of the Rohingyas issues. Um, and uh, language barrier, the number one language language for us because uh, almost 90% of Qing community here in Maryland are refugees. And uh, over 90% of the parents are not high school graduates. And the education system in Burma has been under the military regime. So I'm not going to talk about the culture, uh, but again, the language bearer. We are not fluent in English at all. 
So what has been helpful to us here in Howard County? We had a chain a uh, student liaison position at Howard County Public School. That position has been very helpful to us, okay? Because that position has been communicating between the parents and the teachers. Even how to use computer, how to do um, homework. And, and then because of, you know, I have to blame COVID-19. <laughs> the language bearer, how to complete, how to do uh, uh, assignment because of the virtual education system. So that position has been very helpful to us, the parents, but chains are not only here in Howard County, chains are in Baltimore County, PG County, Montgomery County, um, Frederick County, so uh, for us, um, if we can have more <laughs> student liaison, that would be uh, very, very helpful to us. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Zoe. Okay, so how about um, Sufang? Hi everyone. Thank you for your uh, this opportunity to talk to everybody. <clears throat> and um, I think it's really important to have more knowledge. I in third grade and fifth grade um, Pinehurst Elementary School in Waikamo County, and um, probably only for six students elementary. School. Uh, school, I have a two. So uh, everybody mentioned a lot of things, issue being go with our uh, Asian uh, group. I th now I know we. Uh, I'm not the only one person who have to go with this kind of issue. So they they are never sending a in homework or document to let parents a signature without any translation or multiple translate. So they might have a Haiti language, but not any of the Chinese language, even though we have a five or six Chinese students in a school. Um, I think, I don't know, I don't, I don't want to feel that way, but the speaking more language, this is my, me and my husband will always keep in our mind to tell my boy, you know what you, you know what, you, what your cultures and then speak at least Chinese at home, not in the school, because nobody understand but uh i think i and all hoping um proper school can also recognize multiple different asian cultures near around when they're in a school mostly parents doesn't speak this first language is not english like me i've been to united states since when i 20 21 so i don't i don't speak really well when they when school brings bring back the document they don't my me and my husband doesn't even know so he mostly don't read it then i'm the only person who read it i use my phone to translate but my current document to the other side they have a spanish or haiti so i don't i don't feel really comfortable when i've been to this proper school seven years because we've been to this uh, company for seven years so we talk about this a lot, me and my husband. If we have a more chance, like um, private school, they can provide second language. My, I have a youngest daughter in private school, and she's only four years old. But school providing Chinese, Mandarin, and also Spanish, so she learned three languages at the same time. Um, yeah. But uh, it was not many. A lot of family they like. They want to be uh, sending a kid to the proper school, which is more, you know, like reasonable or not, you know, like it's not everybody's rich. They can pay that much because this is painful. To paying that much, sending kids to the private school, special, the parents like me have 
the multiple kids. So also have a story just happened two days ago. My boy with the lunch lady have a I lady told my boy shop, which is not acceptable. So I had to go to school multiple times and then talk to teacher or talk to a pers uh, person who's in charge. But they they pretty much annoy me. So I had to go back again to tell them mm -hmm. it was not right. And uh, I want people to train my kids right. And also the uh, educational, they, uh, the school have to make sure my kids it don't matter what color we are when we stay in a school to to be a you know respect for thank, thank you sufang i really appreciate your story well i'm hoping that you don't have to go to private school um uh, but you know it's but you have to make the best choice for your children and but you know sometimes it takes um you know it, it the the burden should not be on our kids, but it, it does take the advocacy of parents. And, 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 you know, one of the things I'm learning about Maryland, you know, I grew up in Los Angeles. So I, I took for granted cultural proficiency because it was around me. You know, I went to high schools with a very diverse high school, but I think in Maryland, um, you know, there's still a new phenomenon in, especially part of the Eastern shore where you are at to how to uh, even do basic things like translation, but it's not hard to do it, um, you know, and it takes extra effort and work. And so this is something I have been thinking about. You know, we we have a new law called the Blueprint for Maryland's Future. And one of the responsibilities of the department is to put together uh, 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 something called the English Language Learner Task Force. And one of our strong recommendations is gonna be the expectation, the requirement, frankly, the mandate to ensure translation, even if there's only five, um, uh, but you need, you have a responsibility as a school system. I mean, the fact that you can translate English on your phone, uh, right? It, they they can do the same thing, right? And so it, it's, there's effort that needs to be put in. So I, I appreciate you sharing your truth there. Thank you. Thank you. Um... Let's let's move on. Uh, Ryan, how about you? Can you respond to this question? Yeah, sure. So I feel like, you know, as a multilingual student, it's like, you know, there's a real struggle to find the help I need, especially because like my second language Chinese is not taught in my school. And so in order to prepare for something like the AP test, I was forced to look for outside resources. Uh, instead of being able to, you know, just talk to a teacher, ask for a little bit of help, you know, be able to see what the test is like, I had to find my own resources outside of the school. While, you know, students taking like the French AP test or Spanish AP test can simply go to their teacher. And though they're Chinese, Chinese is a language offered inside my school. It's an online version. So mm -hmm. they would have to, you know, go on a Google Meet and virtually learn Chinese. And we all know that virtually learning is not as good as in-person learning. And the reason why our school doesn't have a Chinese teacher is because of the low enrollment rate. And I think a way to fix this is to be able to take Chinese at a middle school level. So many students who take languages in high school had already taken a year or two of that language inside middle school, like French or Spanish. And so with the ability to take Chinese in a middle school level, we're, you know, we're just creating more students who are interested in taking higher levels of Chinese. And, you know, part of a curriculum of learning a language is also learning about their culture, which could also be a solution to, you know, creating more diversity, learning more culture. So when we like go to French class and we're learning about, you know, French holidays, it's the same for like, you know, Chinese class. So I feel like, having Chinese as an available language for younger students would, you know, increase more enrollment rate and increase more language diversity inside of it. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you. Um, we can have one more person respond to this question. I know, Crystal, you wanted to respond or do you want Amaris to respond? It's, I'm going to turn it over to you. It's mom and daughter. <laughs> So should Emirates, do you want to respond to number two? Uh, yeah, um, for, for me, uh, I'm Korean American. So um, I'm fluent in both Korean and American and English. Um, 
but for people that like have difficulty speaking English that are from Korea, um, for like example, one of my mom's friends, like they had like difficulty speaking um, English. So like I like did like a FaceTime video to help them like learn English, like so that they could um, like write and like read um, English well. And I think that like if in Montgomery County schools or like every school they could offer like classes or like as I said about language before, um, they could um, like help with like meetings and like forming like groups so that people with difficulty to learn like different languages that they don't know yet. Um, people that are bilingual or like fluent in any language could like offer help and like form like groups so that they could actually learn the language in a better way. And I thought it would be like helping building community and so that people that can't like talk and like bring themselves into the community could like have a chance to talk with everybody that they would like to talk to so that they could be more involved. Got it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Thank you. I want to add a uh, little more about that. You know, um, uh, you know, my uh, kids attend, you know, Montgomery County Public Schools, you know, they only can choose either French or Spanish. But I think French is not that useful in these days anymore, <laughs> you know, in, in my opinion. So instead of French, you know, I want to put Korean or uh, Chinese because, you know, they are growing country. So I would like to see the school provide a free subscription for our language side, like a um, Duolingo to, you know, enhance the languages. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, I mean, if you're not speaking a second language, you're already at a disadvantage, right? And what are like the, and if you look at um, our, our country and such, you're right. I mean, there are some people who love learning French, but in terms of when you think about practicality and day to day and who's in our country, yes, you think about Spanish and Chinese and Korean and Vietnamese. And, you know, I learned Tagalog because in Los Angeles, it's in California, it's the third most spoken language. No one ever talks about the third most spoken, but it's it's it's, it's for example. So it it helps to uh, it's something that school systems should be aware of, right? In terms of which languages are important to offer versus just picking one because of just a legacy of more importance versus others. So thank you. Thank you. So uh, we we still have a couple more questions. We could be here all night. So let's move to the next question. Number three, um, numerous sources have documented the increase in hate incidents and discrimination targeting the AAPI community. What is it like for you and your family right now? Um, and how can educators and school leaders build understanding and better support AAPI students and families. Um, we haven't heard from Connie. Connie, do you want to share? Absolutely. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, so myself, I'm Chinese and my son is biracial. He's African American, Chinese. Um, and so I disagree with the reports of the increased crime rate. And um, the reason is that I feel that it has always been in existence to this level. Um, and I have friends and family that are business owners and um, they deal with hate crimes and discrimination incidents all the time for many years since they've migrated to America. Um, and they just never report the incidents because they fear of retaliation. They feel like coming to America to live that dream is an opportunity. So they're not going to complain. They're not, you know, if they get robbed, a lot of them don't even report it because again, they fear the retaliation. They fear the, 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 um, the neighborhood would re retaliate on their children or themselves or the elders. Um, and we also have a lot of friends that are police officials. Um, they're always called to these businesses. Um, because a concerned citizen witnessed something, witnessed a robbery or um, one of the clerks getting uh, punched in the face. And when the police do arrive, they don't wanna speak to the police officers. They don't want to make the report. I think now there's increased awareness because of social media and everybody has electronic recording devices now. 
whether it's via cameras outside of buildings, inside of buildings, everybody has a cell phone, toddlers even have cell phones. So I think now, um, Bert, some Asians um, are not as fearful to speak, but I wanna say a lot, maybe more than 75% um, still have that fear. I know that my mom owns a restaurant in New York um, and we still have friends that have businesses around the DMV and they still have that fear of you know retaliation, um, more so for their children because sometimes the children work at the restaurants and the neighbors mm -hmm. know who the children are. They just don't want them to have any problems at the school. Um, so currently I wanna say that uh, I still get racial slurs yelled at me when I'm commuting about in the DMV. Um, my son, uh, it's hard to tell that he is biracial. Um, he actually looks Hispanic, so you can't really tell that he's African-American or that he's Chinese. Um, but when he was younger, his classmates and peers would always ask him, why does your mother look like that? You know, mm -hmm. um, how come she speaks English and why does not she work at the carryout. Why is she here with us in the field trips? So certain mindsets within our community, um, they're just, they don't know, you know, and um, I've always taught my son that you can't um, get angry or mad because, you, you know, if they don't know, they don't know. It's not their fault. Um, um, currently, uh, when he was in elementary school, they did not celebrate any international holidays. So my son took it upon himself for Chinese New Year that he was going to teach his classmates and peers what Chinese New Year was. Um, <laughs> would bring like a Chinese roll cake or something, a red envelope with the coin in it and a map to show where his mother is from. Um, and he would just take upon his, uh, you know, initiative to do so. Um, in middle school, it was a little bit challenging because of COVID, but we do have a um, Mandarin language offered to uh, the, the honors and tag um, students and they celebrate um, the lunar holiday and they share with the school. Um, but again, the schools that he attend, it's only 1% AAPI and then 99% is African-American. Um, so it's not, um, I don't feel like he feels there's a lack of diversity, um, only because he's biracial. Um, but he definitely is looking forward to his high school because Prince George's County has a science and tech, um, high school that offers the Chinese honor society and, um, AP Mandarin classes. So he's really excited with that. Um, and, you know, I feel like now the teacher, because I advocate for students and the teachers. And right now the teachers don't have the bandwidth to incorporate anything else, especially with COVID, right? And so with that being said, I think that we all need to do our part and just kind of um, advocate within our community. You know, my 13 year old has a nonprofit organization and they help Title I schools. He advocates for diversity, inclusivity for not just um, AAPI, but African-American, low-income families. Um, and that's just something that he does. He meets with elected officials every month. Um, yes. He is always working within the community. And, you know, he's always, I think last month, he found out that the NAACP and the in DC had a international chapter. So he reached out to his mentor and asked, how can the youth be a part of this international um, task force that the NAACP has? Because a lot of people are not aware that the NAACP has also um, helped along with a lot of the AAPI cases as well. So how can we at a youth level how can he at a youth level also advocate and do outreaches within his school? Again, we don't want to, we do want the teachers to teach our children, right? We also want them to, um, I guess, teach them about every culture. And and at this moment with, with COVID and us getting back into the curriculum, it's just really hard. And, and I just feel like we just, 
everybody needs to do their part. We just need to do our part. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, huh. I'm just going to be the bad person here. So please keep two minutes, everybody, if we can um, stick to that. And I have one more. I guess we could choose one more person. Would um, Amy, do you want to respond to number three? Sure, thank you. Um, really quick, though, I do want to shout out Southern California. I'm from Orange County, and I'm actually currently here uh, in the hotel room, obviously. So, <laughs> yeah, um, I would say to the question of, you know, how has um, the anti-Asian hate especially of the last couple of years affected our family is for us, um, especially for me following the murders in Atlanta and then the murders in Indianapolis, which you know we're having anniversaries right now, uh, the one year anniversaries for, I just pivoted my career. Um, and so now I work for an AAPI advocacy nonprofit organization. And that's something that um, was important for me to do um, at this time. But in regards to kind of what can education and school leaders do to build understanding, and I think a lot of folks have already talked to it and it comes down to um, education, right? So we have to start in our elementary schools um, to address behaviors and attitudes that are learned really early on to educate against the stereotypes and some of these learned biases that are at the core of racism. Um, and of course, long-term, we need to educate Americans in general just about our full history. And that's um, not just Asian American communities, but all um, all communities that, that are here in our country and our contributions to the US and the various challenges that um, we've faced because, you know, as Connie mentioned, anti-Asian hate is not new. It has very much been part of our history since since we first, you know, stepped foot, you know, into this country. And so um, for me, it really is passing uh, legislation for history curriculum. And we had two bills that came up this legislative se session both did not um, make it out of committee. And I'm hoping that in conjunction with um, Superintendent Chowdhury's task force or committee that he's gonna be working on, that we can build that momentum from, you know, session just ended. Like, let's build that momentum, work together to really push these forward. And um, I would like to see the expansive history curriculum pass. So that's not including just Asian American history, but, you know, African American history, um, Native American history, Hispanic American history and women's history. Um, because it's when our young people learn about the Trail of Tears, the Chinese Exclusion Act, Japanese American incarceration, but that they also get to learn about like historical figures like Grace Lee Boggs, Ibram Chowdhury, Larry Leon. They learn about these, um, they learn from some of these events, but they also get to celebrate some of, you know, our, our um, people who had pivotal roles in our history. I mean, I think some of that will lend to breaking down the stereotypes that lead to the mis and disinformation or bias and prejudice, um, which ultimately will lead to the violence that we are seeing, right? Um, so breaking down this idea that we're perpetual foreigners, the where are you from question, um, or that we're the model minority. And I think that uh, many people spoke to that, you know, AAPI can be breaking, I mean, it, it's so vast and we're always clumped together. How do we get that data disaggregation so that we could really provide the resources to different communities that need it? Because you know our immigration experiences are so different as well. So I think bottom line, we need to have educators and school leaders who support this curricula. We need to engage in some of these tough conversations that support critical thinking and then provide the background so that our peers will see us as American because they've learned from an early age that we are, you know, and that's supported in our curriculum. So Thank you. Thank you. So we're going to move to the next question because we I, have two people. Oops, sorry. Go ahead. I think Ryan wants to really say something. <laughs> Is that right? I, I see I, his, he talks with his hands like me, so he has to say, I, I, I can't hold him back. Okay. So, so I, there, there go ahead, Ryan. I really do want to talk about in this question. And, you know, personally, I haven't really, you know, experienced any, you know, hateful messages or, you know, aside from the where are you from type of questions, I haven't seen, like, I haven't experienced at the very least any, like, hateful messages, but I feel like, oh, yeah, sorry, uh, I feel like the next thing, the racism that us Asian Americans are experiencing is a little different from, you know, the racism maybe African Americans are experiencing, because the racism we're experiencing is, you guys are invading our country. You guys brought stuff over from your own country and that you guys aren't from America. And well, I feel 
you know, these people fail to realize is that we've, you know, been here from the very beginning. And Asian Americans are so important to U.S. history that if we were not here, the, what we would see as America would be completely different. And, you know, aside from, you know, oh, yeah, we were in part, like the Chinese Exclusion Act, maybe the history teacher mentions that, or the Japanese camps, the history teacher mentions that, but also what we've done for this country, how we have built it to where it is today, is so very important to changing the mindsets of these people and these kids in our county, right? Like, especially with like court cases, right? I feel like every ninth graders heard of Plessy v. Ferguson or Brown v. Board of Education, but they haven't heard of these super important cases of like Juan Kim R or Yiko v. Hopkins. These court cases really, you know, defined American citizenship, especially, you know, these early court cases of the 1800s, before Plessy v. Ferguson, before Brown v. Board of Ed, these court cases really set up America's future and how we are progressed as a country. And uh, these, you know, students don't know about these. And, you know, building the Chinese railroads, oh yeah, we mentioned it, but we don't really see how this railroad really impacted the U.S., how the Chinese were the only ones who were able to build a railroad because of their, you know, cultures and how Chinese culture has also built American culture to what it is today because the railroad is so very significant to the U.S. history and how the challenges, and especially with the mountainous terrain and the deserts, and how they really only could hire the Chinese because they were the ones who really got the job done, how they recruited all these you know, people, how very important we are to the American society and the way our country is now, because, you know, I do a lot of history research. I find it really interesting. You know, I made Jacoby Hopkins my NHD topic. I see all these, you know, great contributions the API community, Asian culture has made to the U.S. and it's not being taught at schools. And, you know, I also testified at um, like a Senate thing in support of one of the Senate bills to include API history. I was there, I was testifying, and I'm also the student representative for Dr. Marijuana, the superintendent for Howard County's um, you know, advisory, API advisory committee. So I've already been working with him on trying to make these changes. But, you know, I feel like the entirety of Maryland needs to be experiencing these changes because the racism we're facing can be changed. And especially how Asian culture is only being seen at like international night as, oh yeah, we're international. We're not from here. And so when we're pushing on API, it's not like Asian American, but Asian culture. And they see us as foreigners when we're really not and how we're super important to the way America is today. And, you know, I really wanted to mention that, so I raised my hand. Oh, I, I am glad I called on you, Ryan. You and I will talk uh, about what it means to go statewide. So uh, I, I'm, I'm like, vote for Ryan. Like, that's where I ended with. We, we could have just ended it right now and just all go, but we, we do have a couple more questions, yes. Ryan. Thank you so much for your passion and for your energy, and you are absolutely right. Uh, the Asian American experience is the American experience, and that is what we need to talk about this. And this is an important framing in, in what you are sharing, right? It is not just a European experience. America is a mix of many cultures contributing to the experiment of perfecting our democracy. So I really, really appreciate you sharing this. Thank you. Yeah. If you need yes. any help with like suggesting curriculum, I'm always here. Oh, I, uh, I, 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 I will definitely. I got you. I, I, you know, I will need your help for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yes, thumbs up. Thank you. Thank you for calling on him. I, I missed that, so I really appreciate right. that. Yeah. So we would thank you, Ryan. Um, let's move to the fourth question, which I think will be our last question, depending on how we are with the time. Um, and I'll call for two people who have not been able to um, speak. I think there are a couple people. So the question is, the students perform better and report enjoying school more when they have teachers and leaders that look like them and share their culture. Describe the impact of having or not having AAPI teachers. What do you think public education leaders should do to recruit and retain more high qualified quality, high quality AAPI teachers? Um, I don't think Sunil and Emily had an opportunity to speak. So, Emily, do you want to go first? And then, um, Sunil, you can go next. Yeah, um, I think this topic is really important because representation matters. Um, I live in Montgomery County, one of the more 
Mm. There's counties in Maryland Michael, having a relatively large AAPI student population. And um, I don't think our current teacher workforce reflects this. Um, currently, one of the seven classes I take, out of the seven classes I take, um, only one of my teachers is of AAPI descent, which is my Chinese teacher, with the rest of my teachers being white. Although I do have good relationships with my other teachers, my relationship with my Chinese teacher is different from my relationships with my other teachers because I feel more open to share my cultural experiences with her. Like I've brought in red banners that my grandma drew for Lunar New Year to share with her. And I've also learned a lot more about my culture outside of regular Chinese class instruction. Like she's brought in Asian snacks and given us red pockets for Lunar New Year with fun messages inside. Um, I think that having a more diverse teacher workforce, including more AAPI teachers, creates a more inviting school environment, especially for students of color, like AAPI students. The teachers that I've had have been really instrumental to my growth as a person, not only academically, but also personally. Um, a lot of my teachers have also been role models to me, and a more diverse teaching workforce could inspire more students to believe that their contributions to society do matter. In other ways, I think that diversifying the teacher workforce can also be beneficial for white students who may be able to gain a deeper understanding of all their other cultures and perspectives. Um, what I think public education leaders can do to recruit and retain more high quality AAPI teachers is to increase support for teachers. I know, especially with the COVID-19 pandemic, teachers have been feeling burnt out and especially earlier in their careers, giving them that support they really need and um, increasing wages and providing more hands-on opportunities to high schoolers that are interested in the teaching profession and also to include more AAPI teachers in the hiring process. Thank you, Emily. All things I've been thinking about, and as you were saying the thing, your suggestions, I was checking them off. Like, I got that, I got that, so I'm good. But I do like the last one, including in the hiring process as well, because that's something. The wages are a given, supporting our teachers, especially on coming out of COVID, and then of course, you know, the hands-on clinical experiences. But hearing about just who does the hiring alone, that's a very powerful space to be in. So that's an important point. Thank you. Thank you. So, Neil, do you want to go next? I don't have the numbers off hand with me, but I believe that Asian and Latino uh, teachers, uh, Latino communities are the least represented uh, in the teacher population in Montgomery County. Um, so, it's, um, so this is a real uh, problem and you have to ask the question, why? Um, and I've, you know, I don't know, some of you may know that I ran for a uh, school board uh, a couple of years ago and, and um, you know, I, I really looked into this a lot. Um, and, and the problem with the, with teacher representation diversity is a persistent problem. It's not a new problem. It's not a COVID problem. It's a 10 year, 20 year problem, right? So it's a, it's a much longer uh, problem. And so in thinking about it, a few things uh, are important, I think, to keep in mind. First, that there is a national shortage of teachers and has been for a number of years. So when teachers as a group, as a, as a, as a whole, are stressed out, uh, are, you know, their working conditions are what they are, and, you know, by and large, they are leaving rather than joining, how do you ask a young uh, AAPI student or Latino student or even a black student to um, join the profession. I mean, that's the the scope of the challenge here. It's not just really, you know, you know, looking at one ethnic group or the other. Uh, the second thing I learned actually from interacting with um, a group called the Bond Educators, which is the uh, black men in education group that is, uh, I, I believe, a national group, or, or you know, at, at the very least in Maryland. Um, and I think one of the things I learned from them was that um, it's very important for um, that history to be reflected in the curriculum. And I think several people have said this already, that the history curriculum is broke. I mean, it is broken. 
we have to fix it. It's broken in many, many ways, representation being only one of them. Civil rights, for example, stops in 1965. That's just unacceptable. Mm -hmm. So as you think about it, Superintendent Chowdhury, um, please keep in mind that, you know, the history curriculum really, really, and you have control over this because it's, that's a state uh, MSD issue. Mm -hmm. So it's not even left to the Board of Education's, the 24 board of, boards of education that are in the, in the state. It's in the hand of the state now. Mm -hmm. And fixing it at the state level is the appropriate level at which we ought to act here. Mm -hmm. Um, the couple of other things I, I think are important to understand, uh, after listening to a lot of people today, I think I also came to this recognition that it's when we are talking about AAPI re representation in the, in the, in the teaching poll, um, that we cannot just leave it at the level of Asian American broadly, but rather we need to look a little bit beyond. Uh, and certainly, I was really moved by um, the uh, by Zoe, who's talking about you know the Chin liaison uh, family liaison person is really that is so important. And you know you can see it broadly in the in the teacher pool and the staff pool uh, and and that kind of um, representation, you know, very targeted, even if there are you know. 10 or 15 or 20 students in a school district that they target some resource at, at those communities uh, is actually very, very important. And the last thing I would say is that also something that I learned today was we need to have some sort of coalitional approaches. Um, it's, so in talking about uh, you know, which teachers we hire, right? Would they be you know, Chinese or Indian or Burmese or uh, Bangladeshi, right? We don't, um, we, we often sort of uh, will miss the fact that, you, you know, that we need to build a coalition uh, of um, Asian, you know, uh, of teachers that, that, you know, sort of speak broadly to the uh, history that we are talking about. Um, I think that's it. Um, welcome yes. again to Maryland and uh, wish oh, you all thanks. success. That's that's it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> thank you so much. I appreciate. I really appreciate a few things you've said um, on the coalition piece. I think is important. Yes, there's coalition across just Asian communities. But there's also just coalition amongst marginalized groups, right? Like Black, Asian, Hispanic, Asian. I mean, the teacher pipeline, diversity piece, cultural relevance piece. This is, you know, this is just a problem in just American history, period, regardless of just Asian underrepresentation, but also other groups as well. And I think, you know, sometimes we all end up being pit against one another, even though we don't want it to. And and that's a problem too. Um, and 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 I think that's something that we need to work on as well. Uh, because you know, uh, you know, working with each other to work on, you know, identity struggles and whatnot is is also fighting for one another as well, right? Um, and so I think that's very important to look at. And so I appreciate you bringing up the coalition piece, but I, I always think about coalition building across cultures as well, right? And not just within a continent, right? Or and such. So thank you for sharing that. If I may just add something specific. Uh, so with respect to the history curriculum, I'm having looked at this problem a little bit deeper, the AP history course, the APUSH, really determines sort of the downs has a downstream impact on the history curriculum mm -hmm. for the rest of the um uh, school you know mm -hmm. for all the other grades mm -hmm. below right and so i hope you're talking to college board about trying to fix that problem oh yeah they if they want to keep business with the state they do have to evolve as well so it is uh very important to say but yes the ap curriculum uh, college board does have a lot of influence as well and i think they're going through a reflective moment as well thank you thank you everyone uh, we do need to wrap up and i do see anusha have a hand up do you want it to ask a quick question or uh Otherwise, we can go to the next um, question that was submitted. Anisha? Oh, I just wanted to make like a quick like elaboration on what Emily said. It'll take it like a few seconds. Is that okay? Sure. Um, yeah, so I know Emily brought up how we need like more um, 
you know, we need to find more ways to like improve staffing and stuff like that uh, in the state. But I feel like as well, like in that pipeline, we need to find ways to teach Asian American students along with the Asian American curriculum. We should be teaching them about how the representation matters in education. Uh, Superintendent Jollery, when you were first appointed, I remember I was ecstatic about it because I was finally seeing representation of not only Asian, but South Asian Americans in education. I feel like speaking not only for myself, but for others, um, a lot of Asian Americans were pushed to like go to really prestigious careers like doctors, engineers, lawyers things like that but i feel like if we teach students a lot about like why it is important that they're in education to see the changes that they want to see for the next generation that can help as well with um recruiting more teachers and having more uh, asian americans go into like teaching academies and things like that thank you so much thank you so there was a one question that we um sahithia you wanted to ask for the superintendent so um, if you can ask the question and if uh, uh, Superintendent Chaudhary could respond uh, for a couple of minutes, then we'll, it, and, and it, we'll wrap up after it, that. Don't make it too hard. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Hello. Um, as I said before, my name is Sahitya and I'm a sophomore in Carroll County Public Schools and will be serving my term as the student rep. On the Carroll County Public School Board of Ed in the 2023-2024 school year, which means I'll be a senior by then. Uh, recently, well, my school system, Carroll County Public Schools, is not is not the most diverse in its students and its population. We have around, and this is a, a very normal number um 2.8 of our percent of our population is asian american pacific islander and we are a majority white public school especially the one i go to so i although i do feel safe in my school and we have been improving a lot this is the first year we've ever had an asian american club we've had an asian student union and this is its first year it's happening we just had a culture fest that we are starting in April 28th, and this is all very new and recent progress. And although it's progress, it there's still a long road to go. I'd like to ask you the question, what are specific ways you can help students who are experiencing microaggressions and discrimination in schools? Because although we, although I have never had to experience fear of being hate crime because I do feel safe in my school, but I have experienced many microaggressions throughout my entire student career. So what is something that you can do to help students who are experiencing this type of discrimination? Absolutely. Great question. Uh, micro microaggressions are a real everyday thing that goes unnoticed and unchecked, but it is very unhealthy and damaging. So first thing is to acknowledge it uh, from the very top right of my uh, seat that I uh, have been honored to be granted by the State Board of Education. So I think that matters first, right? Acknowledging that, you know, there's been a lot of talk about uh, explicit racism and discrimination um, and structural and systemic racism, but microaggressions deserves a place right along with it, right? Because after a while, when we shift away from, um, you know, make progress on the more explicit, right? Um, it just takes another form, right? One of my favorite books is called Racism Without Racists. Um, and it's, it's, it's a problem. And so I think, you know, let's start with teacher preparation, right? One of the things uh, that we have the authority at the State Department of Education is to approve teacher preparation programs. And I think, you know, in addition to teachers knowing their content and how to teach reading uh, well, right? There's also just uh, cultural proficiency, right? And so trainings around implicit bias and microaggressions should be part of the teacher preparation education program. So that's just on the pipeline front. I think there's also just required trainings, right, that should come about uh, uh, regardless of whether you're a veteran or a new teacher that need to be introduced that right now are just not part of of, of the expected trainings from the state, right? It, it, it's seen as like an add-on. It's seen as like something that maybe your school might do or maybe your principal has the wherewithal to see that and call it out but it shouldn't have to take that. So, um, you know, I am not going to be shy as a policy leader, um, as a leader 
leader who does get to make high stakes decision to bring this issue at the forefront. Um, Cause trust me, I have experienced it uh, myself um, and experienced it both as a leader of color, um, even though I am the state superintendent. And so um, and, and trust me, there's a lot of different people uh, trying to tell me how to do this job uh, who do not look like me, right? Because uh, I have changed the hall of pictures in MSDE and what it looks like alone. And so I, I'm with you on this. So one, bringing it to the forefront, training, and then reinforcing it, right? And being able to talk about it because it's not something, uh, there needs to be some kind of, you know, when it happens, it needs to be actually be uncovered and 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 discussed it, and we cannot be afraid and uh, to not talk about it, and and you know, and and people have to learn some. I believe some, many many people just unconsciously do things that they just don't know that are not microaggressions, right? So I think that's the education is part of it. I'm I'm happy to see uh, at the Carroll County Student Board member there is a very uh, you know uh, student diversity, right? I have met her. Uh, my one of my first round tables with was with all of the student uh, board members at the board level and so i've gotten to meet her and so i think we continue on and talking about it and just i can assure you that it is something that will be at the forefront uh, for me as well in addition to how to get reading going uh, well and algebra and everything else because all of that matters so thank you so much Thank you, everyone. Uh, we did go a little over, so we will try to close up here and to our participants and those of you viewing on the YouTube live, the State Board, MSDE and MAC. Thank you for joining us tonight for this community conversation with AAPI students and families. We want to hear from you, our, our um, viewers as well. Uh, we ask every Marylander to complete the strategic planning survey at marylandpublicschools.org forward slash survey. We will also post a link to that in the chats. So please fill this out and share and also share with uh, your communities. Again, thank you for joining us tonight. We look forward to working collaboratively with you, um, our communities, to ensure every Maryland student has the opportunities needed to realize their full potential. So Superintendent Chaudhry, would you like to say closing remarks? I, there's a lot that I have said today. A lot of you have said, um, you know, I won't keep you too long. Please fill out the survey. You will see once you click on it, the landing page, you will see multiple languages front and center because um, we we wanted to acknowledge right away that Maryland is uh, truly uh, an American miniature and we want to make sure we get multiple perspectives and voices. So please uh, pass that on and complete it. Um, but as I said, uh, and as you guys have said, representation matters um, and it is and it's for me, it cannot just be a feel good one class or, you know, an international night or um, or even just, you know, being able to just acknowledge the history, it has to be embedded and woven into the K-12 educational experience. And so that is how I will be thinking about this. So, um, and that is what the task force work will be. And I will be reaching back out. I'm going to start with Ryan though. I just, <laughs> he, 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 you know, if we were going to play a highlight reel, he, he should lead us into the highlight reel. And so I really appreciate um, all of your time and thank you so much. And I'm excited to be in Maryland and it's great to know that I am not alone. And this, this really felt more of like a being at home for me too, and having this conversation. So, and with my friends and family. Uh, so thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Superintendent Chaudhary and community conversation participants and YouTube live viewers. Thank you so much and have a great evening, everyone. Thank you. You too. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much. Have a good evening, everyone. Thank you. Bye, Ryan. Bye. Bye, everybody. I just love you. Thank you, Amy. Thank you for speaking with us. It was a very nice conversation. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>